Welcome to Philosophy and Faith, where our goal is to help you navigate your intellectual and spiritual journey, especially in regards to topics like God, faith and doubt, meaning and purpose, and more. I'm Nathan Beeson. And I'm Daniel Jepson. And together we discuss the big questions that humans have wrestled with for thousands of years. We're glad you can join us. Hello, Nathan. Hello, Daniel. Today we get to talk about Heraclitus. Heraclitus. Yeah. A minute ago when we began talking about this, you said it sounds like a disease. <laughs> I have acute Heraclitus. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But no, actually, he is one of the great philosophers of the pre-Socratic world. In his defense, I feel like a lot of these Greek names sound like diseases or something. Yeah, yeah, they're a little bit different, aren't they? <laughs> Miletus. And... That's a city. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Greek folks, the Greek yeah. cities, the places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, their names don't come tripping off our tongues, at least. Yeah, so Heraclitus, why are we talking about him? And can you give us a little bit of a... An overview situate us today. Right. I'm not going to be talking about every philosopher, by the way. There is a good podcast that does that, The History of Philosophy Without Gaps with Peter Adamson. But we're going to be tracing the main flow and analyzing it as we go along. So we're going to be talking about Heraclitus because he's a part of that flow, that great conversation. He's an integral part. In fact, I think he is arguably the greatest philosopher or the most influential anyway before Socrates and Plato. He's also going to be very influential in Roman philosophy and also Christian theology because of his introduction of the notion of the Logos. Sweet, sweet. Yeah. So when was he alive? Where did he live? He lived in Ephesus, and that is now Western Turkey, but of course it was a Greek city back then in that larger area called Ionia. He is a Greek, writing in a Greek city. He dates from around 525 to 475. And these dates, again, are a little fuzzy like most of the others. He's known for a couple things personally. One is that he is rather obscure in his writing sometimes. In fact, he is called the Riddler or Heraclitus the Obscure. And that's partly because his philosophy maybe is a little bit more nuanced or detailed. And, and then also he just writes in these short, pithy statements. So do we have some of his original... Well, not original documents, but some of the manuscripts, perhaps, because of the excavation that's happened in Ephesus? Or have those kind of gotten spread around and we just have more of the traditions? Or, Well, actually, he's the first one that we have a good deal of writing from directly. Sweet. So he apparently wrote a book called On Nature. Physics is the Greek word. And we don't have the whole thing, but we have the first part of that. And then you have the interpretations of him by Plato and Aristotle and the other Greek philosophers. So we actually have a pretty good amount. But a lot of the times he tends to write in these short, pithy statements. He doesn't so much explain and reason as declaim and pronounce. Do you have some examples of that? I do. The first two of these show also another trait of his is he comes across as a misanthrope, you know, kind of looking down upon the average person and even other thinkers. So, quote, Homer should be turned out of the list and whipped. <laughs> Here's another quote. The learning of many things does not teach understanding. Otherwise, it would have taught Hesiod and Pythagoras and Xenophanes too. So those are more of his pungent ones that... He's kind of picking some fights there. Yeah, yeah. He's throwing he, some shade. One gets the idea he's kind of a jerk. I don't know. That may have been just the way they did things back then, their intellectual discourse. and. Yeah, I mean, he's got to separate himself from those guys. Now, remind me, is he contemporary with those? A little bit later. Okay. So he, he probably doesn't actually know them no. personally. Okay. He's just interacting with some of their streams of thought and yep. their writings and that kind of thing. That's funny. Wow. Here's some more of his short, pungent phrases. Man is called a baby by God. Donkeys prefer straw to gold. Nature loves to hide. The road up is the road down. Hmm. And then he's got two others that are his most famous aphorisms. And these are quoted by Plato and Aristotle and others. First is, Everything is in flux. And then the second, going along with that, you cannot step into the same river twice. Hmm. Now, as we'll talk about, that's not exactly what he said. But the easiest way to think about Heraclitus and the way that he's often thought of, he's the guy that taught that everything changes. There's no permanence in the world. Everything's in flux. That is certainly how Plato interpreted him. And thus Plato set him in opposition to Parmenides, the next philosopher we'll study, 
who said that change is impossible. Things only seem to change. So for Plato, then, you get these two guys kind of serving as a perfect foil for his own philosophy. They're opposites. And then he integrates their ideas together of change or permanence. He did that by arguing that things in the realm of material objects do change constantly, but things in the realm of form or ideas are eternal and unchanging. Yeah. And we've kind of hinted that notion before when we get to Plato. We'll talk about that a lot. Yeah, but I can totally see how he's starting to lay some groundwork. Now, here's the deal, though. Plato was wrong. <laughs> That's a bold statement. Yeah, it is. He should be, what, whipped like Homer? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I won't go that far. But he was wrong about Heraclitus. Either because he was trying too hard to fit him into his scheme and use him as a foil and opposite to Parmenides, or because maybe his knowledge of him was secondhand and deficient. I mean, he's writing almost 100 years later, so he might have gotten his understanding of Heraclitus from Heraclitus's later following. But Heraclitus did not say, you cannot step into the same river twice. What he actually said was, upon those stepping into the same rivers, ever different waters flow. So you're saying that his writing said, upon those stepping into the same rivers, ever different waters flow. But scholars will suggest that Plato's writing, he's trying to quote, but just gets the quote wrong. Yeah, that's right. So some of his followers may have taken that and misconstrued it or something. Plato picks up on it. But, right. Okay. Right. I'm trying so, to understand why you say Plato got him wrong there. It just doesn't match exactly. Right. And then because of that, the whole idea, he doesn't say that everything is in flux and nothing is constant. It's much more nuanced than that. I see. So to your point, Plato's trying to put him in a certain box in order to help him fit his own ideas. Right. And he may or may not do that innocently. In other words, that may indeed be what he thought he said, or maybe he's trying to fudge sure. the data a little bit. But think of the difference. He doesn't say you can't step into the same river twice. He says, upon those stepping into the same rivers, ever different waters flow. So the river, in one sense, is the same. In another sense, it's not the same. Mm. So Seneca, the Roman orator, he says, and this is a direct quote from his moral letters, quote, this is what Heraclitus says. We both do and do not step twice into the same river, because you see, the name of the river stays the same, but the water keeps flowing. Heraclitus's point is that it is the same river, and yet it's a different river at the same time. Obviously, the water is different, but the form of the river, its bank and direction and slope, stay the same. Otherwise, there would be no river. Hmm. Yeah, so there's some nuance there, but why is that an important distinction? Well, because what he's trying to do is not to say that everything changes, but he wants to explore the nature of change and how the one and the many fit together. That is, is reality one thing or many things? And if one, how do we account for the diversity, including change? And if many, how do we account for the unity or the universe? Now, this is going to get a little bit complex, but the juice is worth the squeeze here because there's a lot of understanding that can come out of this. We have to understand two things about Heraclitus and his teaching. First is fire, and the second is logos. So we're going to talk about those two things. Fire and Logos? Fire and Logos. Okay. Do you remember how Thales had the saying that everything is water? Mm hmm And Anaximenes said everything is air? Yep. Right. So Heraclitus is going to say everything is fire, but he's not saying it in quite the same way as those other guys. It's more nuanced. The fire is the visual description of change or permanence. The one and the many is fire. And the mechanism that both generates and controls the fire is the Logos. It's also called the one or the divine. So put those two ideas in your mind, that everything is this giant fire. So not like a campfire, it's more hidden. It's more underneath the structure of things that we see. But reality is changing like this giant fire that consumes and then produces and changes things. And what controls this and what generates this is the logos, the one or the divine. So does he mean fire as a metaphor there? I mean, things aren't all physically hot. I'm trying to understand what that means exactly. Yeah, I don't think it is just a metaphor for him, but probably not like the fire that we normally experience. He's thinking of fire more in an abstract way than any particular fire that we would play around with or experience. 
So fires this image of constancy and difference or constancy and change in the sense that it's flames dancing and moving, but it's all stays constant as energy and heat or something. Sure. The way that fire changes things, we could go into that a good deal and spend some time there, but I probably won't just because it gets a little technical. But basically, when you think of fire, all things feed into the fire. The fire takes all things, consumes them, and when it does so, it changes them. Now for him, though, it doesn't just consume them. It also, as it changes them, produces something else. So just like fire produces ashes, he's thinking of this fire as producing two opposite kinds of things or pushing in two opposite directions. He will describe one as the way up. So fire sometimes changes things in an upward way. Mm-hmm. And here he's thinking more of things that are, are dry, things that are thin. And then it also produces things in the downward way. He gives a little bit more detail here. So the downward way fire produces things is it becomes heavier, becomes water, becomes sea, and then eventually becomes earth. So all things are consumed by the fire, but then they're changed in something else through the fire. Okay. That's the basic idea. And again, the mechanism, I've read a couple of different ways this is described, and I think I understand it, but to explain it all would take another 10 or 15 minutes. Okay. That's helpful the way that there's a process of change that fire mediates. Right. This fire is in a constant state of tension and change or flux and has these two upwards and downward aspects. And so all reality then is dominated by this idea of things changing, but also in opposite directions. So this idea of conflict or opposition is going to be very central. And even warfare, the opposite of wills working against each other, he regards that as just an essential part of the the universe. Hmm. There's a passage in the Iliad where Achilles is mourning the death of his friend and says, oh, that conflict and war would cease from the earth. And his comment, Heraclitus comments on that, Well, basically what he's wishing is the abolition of reality itself, because reality is Mm -hmm. this opposition, this warfare, to use a term loosely. So it's like tension between opposites. Yes. My my mind kind of goes to like yin and yang. Is there... Yeah, I don't know if that would work for this or not. Think of something like playing on a violin or a lyre that they would have back then. What creates the music? It's when the bow opposes the natural static state of the string It makes it do something it would not otherwise do. Hmm. So those are opposition to each other, but that's what produces the music. Ooh, that's a good illustration there. Let's come back to then this idea of change, and we'll see how the logo spits into all this. Let's take this and work it into his idea of the river, for example. It's the same river, although the water in it constantly changes, even by the nanosecond, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Yet unless the shore of the river and the bed of the river had some permanence, then the river would not exist. You just have water in a field. So his goal was not to deny change, but to understand how some things change and why something does not change. And so the world order, cosmos, and that's where this fire comes in. This is a quote from him. This world order then, the cosmos, the same for all, No God made or man made, but it always was and is and will be in everlasting fire, kindling by measure and going out by measure. Now, he doesn't mean it ever extinguishes. It's eternal. It's an everlasting fire. But what goes into it is kindled and goes out is the idea. So this world order then, the same for all, no God made or man made. It's not made by God or man, but it always was and is, and will be an everlasting fire, kindling my measure and going out by measure. So the cosmos is one thing, fire. But this fire is not so much the substance of the cosmos, like water was for Thales, but more of its essence and its working. It's the the meaning and how it works rather than just the substance that it is, like water was for Thales. Fire changes all things. Things are burned up by becoming something different. Fire lives by feeding these things and then transforming them into other things. And it's in a constant state of flux. It's got these two paths, the upwards and downwards. What is unchanging? What is the bed and the bank of the river? The fire itself. The fire is uncreated and eternal and unquenchable. And in this sense, he'll even talk about the fire being divine, the one with a capital O. 
It's it's an interesting and different way of thinking about it, but it, I'm starting to piece it together. I mean, when you first mentioned it, I was like, what the heck is he talking about? <laughs> but this idea that fire lives by feeding and it transforms things. And I, I just have to get my mind away from fire just being all about heat and energy and light. And Right, exactly. It's almost like the function of fire. What's the function yes. of fire, not what's the essence of fire? Yeah, I think that's a good way to think of it. So it's it's starting to make sense. Do you remember how we've talked about, from the very first episode, this idea buried in the bedrock of Greek thought all the way back from its beginnings on the Isle of Crete of this shapeless stream mm -hmm. and all things arise out of this stream and then they go back into it? I haven't seen anyone else make this connection before, but it seems something like that. Mm -hmm. It's this principle that is the one and other things come and go out of that almost to me it's very similar to that yeah i'm starting to see that too so he will talk about this one being divine so he was what you would call a monist because he believes all is one and he'd also be a pantheist because he identifies that one with this universe itself so it's not created and separate from a creator god it is identified with this universe now, I think many of the other philosophers, we talked about this before, we could probably call them monist. I mean, Thales, everything is water. That, yeah. Im that implies a kind of monism, but he's the first one to kind of make this more explicit. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So it's not a personality. No. But there is a, a oneness to society, or to the world, the cosmos. Right. Yeah. And then he makes an interesting statement. He says, the one is, quote, both willing and unwilling to be called Zeus. So it's both willing and unwilling to be called Zeus. What's he mean by that? Well, it's willing to be called Zeus because presumably for most people, Zeus is the common name for the highest of gods for the divine. But it's unwilling because for two reasons. First, the one is not a person. And second, because Zeus, at least as portrayed by Homer and Hesiod, is a scoundrel. Yeah. <laughs> Again, he's the Riddler. He's the obscure one. Okay, so he's the Riddler. Yeah, and this is an example of that statement. So the one can be called Zeus because that's what most people think or when they think of the most exalted being or, or the most exalted thing. But at the same time, he shouldn't be called Zeus because he's not a person besides Zeus is a scoundrel. The <laughs> one is much beyond this. So normally, he will call the one God, but he will refer to it as the one, the wise, reason, or... The Logos. The Logos. And this is the first time that Logos is going to be used in a philosophical or religious sense. Yeah, so Logos, that's a, that's a Greek word. It is. So we'll probably talk about the technical definition, but what does that, how does that get translated into English? Word. Okay. <laughs> normally. Okay. So it is the word that you would normally use to just say someone said this. There is another word, rhema, which can has a slightly different uh, semantical domain or shade of meaning. But normally, if you're just going to say Jesus said this in the Greek New Testament, it would be logos. So that's the basic meaning of the word. But remember, words can have a very broad right. semantic range. Let's think about that word logos. Now, originally, both not only in the New Testament, but in the Greek of Heraclitus and the others, it would simply mean a word, something you would say. But you can easily see how that shifts just in the way that we use it today. All right, so say that you come from uh, some conference or something, and you're gone for a week, and you come back, and I say, hey, what's the word from this conference? And what I mean is not what is one particular word, but mm -hmm. what's the message or what happened? Uh, what was the theme? And when you think of it like that, then you see, okay, it already has a broader meaning. But then also, because of that, it has this idea of message, idea, which are usually conveyed by words, so that there's that close association. And then normally, when you have a message or an idea closely attached to that is the reasoning or the rationale behind that mm -hmm. message or idea, or you might say the logic. So yeah. guess where we get the word logic from? Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> from Logos, or it could be further on a field of study. So theology is a study of God. Anthropology is a study of mankind, right? With the logi at the end. That's right. Yeah. 
Yeah. So it has yeah, low G and all yeah. that idea. Okay. Um, yeah. Huh. So that's interesting that that's where we get those words. Like, right. So it, the container of sorts packed into it is rationale and logic and even emotion could be packaged into the logos, maybe. I'm not sure about emotion, but reason or purpose. Certainly. Okay. Think of it this way. You've got one thing that changes into another, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got an acorn that changes into an oak. What has to happen or what do you have to have to make sense of that? Well, one thing you have to have the, the actual physical substance. Something is changing into something else. Uh, a green leaf is changing into a red leaf in the fall. Mm -hmm. Acorn is changing into an oak. So you have the actual substance. And then for us to conceptualize that, we also have to think about what it changed from and what it changes into. So those two poles opposite each other, as it were, what it changed from, what it changed into. Mm -hmm. So you've got those two concepts. And then third, you have to have something that brings the change about. For him, that was the Logos. The Logos is both the source of the change, but also why it changes the pattern, the rationality, the way it works, and the reason it changes. All that's what he means when he uses this word logos like that. So in that illustration, what's the fire? Because I thought you were going to say the thing that changes it is the fire, but it seems like the fire and the logos are pretty closely. Yeah, they are, as best I can understand it. And again, he's a, he's he's a little a bit Riddler, obscure. Yeah. He is the Riddler. I think sometimes he equivocates on what is fire and what is the logos. But the best way I can understand it overall is that the logos is what brings about the fire and also what guides the fire into what it's doing. So how do we know that when the fire changes one thing, it changes it into the thing it should be, or what's the mechanism for that, mm. instead of just obliterating that? I think he would say that's the logos. Okay. That's the difference between the logo and the fire. Okay, yeah. So that idea then is implying something very important that's going to have a huge pedigree in the intellectual thought of the West and in Christendom is that there is this reason, this rationale, this purpose, this blueprint for why reality is what it is and what it's doing. And you're going to find that coming again in Plato, but more especially in Aristotle. He's going to talk about the four causes. This one correlates best to the final cause why something exists. But you're also going to find that John's going to use that in John chapter 1, right? Mm -hmm. So in the beginning was the... Logos. Right. And again, it's translated in English as word. Oftentimes it's capitalized, though, because it's clearly referring to Jesus, Yeah. if you read the rest of that chapter. So John, the New Testament writer, writing in, say, 60 or 70 or 80 A.D., is using that term to describe Jesus as the one who brings all things into existence. It seems like John's doing that intentionally. Perhaps there's some Greek in his audience, or he's at least well-versed in the philosophy of the day and pointing how Jesus is that. I definitely think he uses that intentionally and purposefully. Now, for people that he was writing to, and in his mind, there's going to be two streams of thought associated with that word logos. One of those is that Greek stream that we just talked about. But the other is going to be the Old Testament, where primarily that word is going to be used in a deep sense, more than just a casual sense, about the word of the Lord, the word of God, speaking into creation, speaking into this world, either as an act of creation or judgment. Hmm. So still what's guiding the change in the world? what's generating the things of this world in the first place and then guiding them along with some rational plan and purpose. Yeah. So if you look there, especially in, in John 1, he says, in the beginning was the Logos. All right, anyone who's at all familiar with the Bible is going to say, wait, in the beginning, that's harkening back to Genesis 1. Yeah. And how did God bring things into existence in Genesis 1? Through speaking. Right. And God said. Now that's very different than the creation myths of the ancient world. Not only because it's a totality of God creating things ex nihilo out of nothing, but the way he does it by speech instead of forming or sometimes mm -hmm. by slaying in conflict, like in some of the myths of Mesopotamia, mm -hmm. very different. And so John is, I think, intentionally combining both uses because it has both ideas. 
Like Jesus is the way that God did that. And then Jesus is also the meaning of creation. So he's not just the one who generates it, but he is the fullest meaning of that in a very deep sense. That's amazing. Yeah. And I'm thinking, okay, if I'm familiar with the Hebrew scriptures, in the beginning, God is how the book starts. Right. In the beginning, <laughs> God created the heaven and the earth. And yeah, he uses his voice, but in the, in the beginning was the logos. Okay, that makes sense. I mean, those fit well together. Yeah. In the beginning, but then you're right, as John says, oh, and the word put on flesh mm. or became flesh in the person of Jesus. Yeah. That's speaking something pretty profound about who Jesus was. Yes, yeah, it certainly is. <laughs> So he is claiming that Jesus is the will and word of God made flesh, that he is the meaning and fulfillment of the universe, the rational pattern of why it exists and how it exists in the form it does, who has now taken on the very elements of the universe in human flesh. That's an outstanding claim. I think Paul picks up on that later when he says, all things are created through him and by him and for him. It's kind of a similar philosophical point Yes, Colossians 1. Yeah. Yeah. All things are created by him and for him. Wow. Huh. All right. We got carried away. I have to put back in my mind what's the next thing to yeah, talk so about Yeah, but that's all got its grounds sure. in this idea of Heraclitus. He's about 500 years before John's writing, roughly. Yes. And he's not the only one who's going to talk about the Logos in this way. He's just the first. So I don't think John's necessarily reading Heraclitus, but he's certainly familiar with how the Greeks use that word. Yeah, okay. He's picking up on that tradition of Greek thought. One more thing we could talk about here, and then we can do a little bit of evaluation. Because of his work on change and the dynamics of change and the nature of the love reality, he's also really one of the first to give a good explanation and analysis of the one and the many. So have you ever heard that phrase, the one and the many, or the problem of the one and the many? Mm, I don't know. Okay. So one of the things that the Greeks are dealing with, and somewhat before him, but especially more after him and because of him, is the universe one thing or many things? If it's one thing, then how do you account for the apparent difference of all the things within the universe? If it's many things, then how do you account for the apparent unity of the universe? Mm Mm-hmm. So that problem is going to be pervasive in early philosophical thought. And if I'm interpreting Heraclitus right, I think we can get some modern analogies of the way that he kind of advanced that idea. And that is by understanding that unity by its nature includes different and even opposing things. And that, again, comes from that idea that all reality is this working of opposites together to form one harmonious part. So you can't even really have unity unless there's distinct elements that are being unified. Right. At least not in the fullest sense of the word unity. Yeah. Unity is not uniformity. Exactly. (laughs) Uh, I will try to get some examples of this in my mind and here are a couple I came up with. I think they work. First example, picture in your mind a herd of cows in a field or a hillside. Is that a unity? Kind of, right? They're separate cows, but in your mind, you've got the idea of a herd of cows or a hillside of cows. So there is a conceptual unity, oh, yeah. but each one is distinct. Yeah. It, like even the use of plural language to define a singular thing, like yeah. a herd, mm-hmm. like that's a thing, but it's also made up of a lot of things. That's true. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. But now contrawise, think of an individual cow itself. A cow displays within itself a different kind of unity in which the different parts of its body are both distinct, like the different cows in the field, but they're also unlike. Teeth are unlike lungs. Lungs are unlike hoofs. Yet teeth and lungs and hoofs and all the other parts of the body, though they are both distinct and unlike each other, form a unity, Yeah, the cow itself. That is a unity of different things, sometimes working in much different ways or even oppositional ways to produce something that is a more complex, more full unity than simply a herd of cows in a field. Yeah. So that's one example. You want to hear the other one? Yeah. That's good because I'm going to tell it to you. Anyway. Good. <laughs> yeah. What if I'm like, nah, I'm good. We got it. <laughs> <laughs> the other analogy or illustration or metaphor, whichever term you want to use here, 
Uh, imagine a lawn table, and on one end is a large bucket or maybe a large pile of random Lego pieces. So maybe you've got a pile or a bucket of 10,000 Lego pieces. And then the other end of the table is a spaceship, maybe of 10,000. Do they make that many pieces? No, I don't probably know. not. Like a Lego spaceship? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, mm, I have no idea, but that okay. seems like that'd be huge. It would. So, haven't, haven't. purpose of example, it's a Lego spaceship model with 10,000 pieces. And of course, all the pieces are not the same, right? Yep. You've got different colors, you've got different shapes, you got different sizes. So the bucket or the pile of Lego shows diversity because the pieces are different, they're not joined together. So they show diversity, but there still is a conceptual unity. You can talk about a bucket of them or a pile of them. The second though, the spacecraft shows diversity in a deeper unity. The pieces are all still different colors and shapes and sizes, but because of that and how they're placed, they all fit together uniquely to create a spaceship. So that's the two different ideas of unity and vari variation. The first is one that's a conceptual unity only, a one where the mind groups the individual things together even though they're distinct. And the second is a functional unity where each piece is not only separate, but they're also connected to each other in such a way that the differences create something much more than the mere sum of its parts. Hmm. Now, which picture describes reality? Heraclitus says the second picture does. Yeah. He's picking up on the fact that there does seem to be cooperation and unity within the diversity. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That people, people work together and we think about trees and plants and fields and forests and that kind of thing. They're, there seems to be some sort of cooperation. Right. He argues that what's true of a human body or a cow's body is also true of reality as a whole. Yeah. That there is a oneness, but the oneness works in spite of opposition and different purposes or different ways that things are, the diversity of the elements within the universe. Hmm. So in that sense, I think he makes a pretty good advance on previous philosophy. Yeah, because the other guys have pretty much just said it's one, it's water, or right. it's wind. And he's trying to bring some nuance to, well, there is a, a oneness in a sense, but you got to account for the variance. That seems like a pretty significant advance in philosophy. Yeah, I think so too. And again, going back to the Lego spaceship, the logo in this illustration would then be basically the instruction book. Mm. Or the model of what that plane or a spaceship would be in the mind of whoever designed the kit. And then the instruction book is the written communication of that, the revelation of that, as it were. Yeah, I like how you uh, made a metaphor of Legos for Logos. <laughs> it's pretty good. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, it's pretty good. Legos wow. and Logos is the name of this episode, I think. Maybe we should. Gotta put Heraclitus in there somewhere, though. Heraclitus and his Legos of Logos. Or something. I like it. I mean, yeah, I mean it's pretty good. actually. <laughs> I mean, it's a good picture, yeah. I didn't know they had Legos back then, though, but who knew? Well, a lot of people don't. Yeah. <laughs> it's been crazy what archaeology has dug up in the past 100 years, huh? <laughs> well, you want to talk about the influence of Heraclitus? Yeah, I'd love to hear that, especially in Christian thought. We've talked a little bit about how John picks up on this tradition of language related to the Logos, but can you give us an, an overall analysis and uh, some of the things you're thinking about as we're processing through the contribution of Heraclitus. All right. So I'm going to talk about the influence on Greek thought, Roman thought, Christian thought, and then give a little bit of analysis at the end. Sweet. All right. So Greek thought, he influenced Plato and Aristotle, who would, of course, influence Christian theology. In particular, his idea of the realm of the one would be taken out by Plato in his hidden or, or better transcendent world, the world of forms or ideas. And in Plato's understanding, the chief and the ruling form was that of the one, or it's sometimes called the good. He also influenced Aristotle in the idea of the four kinds of causation, as we talked about. And I think the idea of a final cause being the ultimate purpose for something is very much in line with, probably influenced by Heraclitus, like the Logos being the final purpose of the cosmos. Yeah. Now... There's also a school of thought, and here we're starting to talk about the Roman philosophy as well, but there is a school of thought that starts in Greek philosophy, it becomes one of the two dominant streams in Roman philosophy, and that is of Stoicism. There is Greek Stoicism, but again, it becomes even more influential during the Roman Empire. 
One of the things that Heraclitus taught was that the one operated out of necessity. So this was deterministic. All things were set. So the Logos just was this rational way that things worked together. And there was really no room for much in the way of chance or free will. It was very deterministic. Now, if that's true, then probably the wisest thing to do is simply to accept that Mm -hmm. and then live within the Logos of one's life as best you can without getting too excited or worried about things that you can't change anyway. And that could be argued as a pretty good summation of the essence of Stoicism. Hmm. Many of the Stoics will claim him as their founding father, as it were. Yeah, I can definitely see that connection. There's very little I know about Stoics. And even the way that we've used that language, like somebody who's Stoic, they're very, I don't know how you say it. Unperturbed? Yeah, they they just want to do things. It's very black and white, and they want to do it the right way and not let their emotions get involved. Yeah. And then we've already talked about how the introduction of the philosophical meanings of the Logos will influence Christian thought quite a bit. And it doesn't just stop at John, of course. One of the ideas that's going to be carried forward into Augustine and through that to the Christian theology as a whole is this idea that there is this logical pattern or idea in the mind of God through which he creates the universe. And that kind of goes along with the same theme. Finally, let's give a couple words of analysis. What do you think of Heraclitus? It seems to be some pretty significant advances. Yeah. And at first was a little tricky to understand uh-huh. the way that fire was kind of the first principle there. Right. And the concept of logos is a difficult. I still don't totally, I can't wrap my mind around it. <laughs> But it's interesting. It, it'll be a good food for thought to think through the ways that the biblical authors pick up on that a little bit. Yeah. Seem like, seems like a pretty significant figure. It, it makes sense that we're touching on. Yeah, I think so. One of the ways I like to begin thinking about how to evaluate these thinkers, and by the way, I notice when I listen to or read people very often giving a, a history of philosophy is that they tend to shy away from evaluation. And I think maybe because it muddies the water, it adds to things, but also it adds a subjective element. Mm -hmm. And they're wanting to be impartial uh, about that. And I get that. But that's not where I'm at. I I want to understand things in the flow of thought and what works and what doesn't. So I think there is a lot here in terms of advancing the idea of causation, the idea of change, especially understanding this idea of unity and diversity and all that that implies and the fullness of what true unity is. Uh, At the same time, we have to remember that this Greek philosophy, including Heraclitus, is a project in trying to make rational sense of the world by human autonomy and human reasoning alone. Mm -hmm. So no revelation, no religious dogma, no mythological elements that you're inheriting. You're not basing this or adding anything like that to this. It's the human mind alone. And I think the question I want to come back to again and again, because I think it's not only a fair question, but the central question is, does it work? Can you get to a philosophy that can justify itself and give warrant for what it teaches on the basis of human autonomy alone and human reasoning alone? In that sense, I think he's found deficient. And for two reasons. Number one, to have the ability to find and convey truth about these things. And that's what he's trying to do. Two things have to be true. Two things have to be true, and you have to, I think, have warrant to believe them within your own system. First, that the universe is able to be rationally understood. And then secondly, that the human mind is the right tool to be able to actually rationally understand that. And we talked about this before. Um, Do you remember we talked about how when I was learning Hebrew, because the letters are so different, I would often just practice writing the letters mm-hmm. yeah. one after another and no random order. I wasn't making words. All I was doing is practicing letter. Imagine if you take one of those pages, if you had one of those, you discovered upon it my desk, maybe a janitor when they're you know, cleaning the office building where I'm working or something, or my wife comes across it and she doesn't know Hebrew at all. And you have two pages. One is a translation out of one of the rabbinic writings of the Bible a story or a treatise, an essay, something like that. And then the other page is just my scribbling, not my scribbling, but my practicing penmanship. Mm -hmm. 
One of those has a meaning. One of those tells a story or an argument. The other doesn't, even though they both have the same elements of the certain letters involved. Yeah. One of the things that Heraclitus' philosophy cannot establish is that this universe we're in is actually rationally understood, that it means something rationally. It's not just bits of information that aren't connected to each other in any particular way. So he's making that assumption. Now, he does have this idea of the logos being what ties it all together, right? Mm -hmm. So the logos is the rational explanation. So I'll give him credit for that. That is an advance on most of the other philosophers we've looked at. But at the same time, where does that come from? Yeah. Is it just here? If it's just here, how do we know that it's rational? Ideas, reasons, normally reside in a mind. But if you exclude the idea of a mind that produced this, if you say that this is not God-made or man-made, it just always is and was, then how can we have any confidence that that's anything more than a wish. Mm -hmm. And I don't think he gives a good answer for that or a reason for how you could answer that according to his system. Yeah, it's interesting that in pointing to how that is like Zeus, but also unlike Zeus, he approaches the Logos being some sort of rational personality. He, he gets close, you know. But then he backs away. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, I mean, that makes sense too, because Zeus is a scoundrel. But... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's a jerk. Yeah. He's a superhero jerk. No. Um, all right. The second thing, as I mentioned, so first is that the universe is actually able to be rationally understood because it has a meaning and it conveys that meaning. And the second, that the human mind is capable of understanding. So if I run across a page in Sanskrit, it might tell a great story, but I can't decipher it. My mind is not able to. It's not, it doesn't have the right tools. Mm -hmm. Does the human mind itself, is it capable of understanding and communicating this truth? I don't know on Heraclitus's grounds that you had warrant for believing that. We are simply some particular manifestation of the fire that changes all things. Yeah. Why would I necessarily have confidence that that fire is able to understand true truths about reality, real truths about this universe that we live in, and that especially this hidden element of the universe that we can't see, this secret fire, as it were. It kind of goes back to the very first philosopher we talked about, Thales. Mm -hmm. You know, he made the same as everything is water. Okay, then my mind is water too. Yeah. And your mind is water. The same mind that said everything is water is actually water. So why should I trust some motion of water within your mind that created that statement mm -hmm. as being the right one? It's not even made to think or come up with conclusions related to that argument in and of itself. It's, it's almost self-defeating. Yes. I think the same problem arises even more powerfully after Darwin. If you believe that natural selection alone, unguided by God, so not just evolution, but it's totally unguided evolution for the purposes of reproduction by the mechanism of survival of the fittest, then our minds, the same minds that are pronouncing that theory, also are simply the product of that same evolutionary and biological activity just like every other organ of our body is. Mm -hmm. So why should we trust it? It's not designed to be true. It's designed to pass on its genes. Those aren't the same thing. Yeah. And we talked about that in a previous podcast. There was one titled, Is Naturalism Self-Defeating? Yeah. That's not to argue that God could not use evolution. It's to argue that natural selection by itself, completely unguided, has a problem with self-justification and self being self-defeating. Yeah. So that's kind of the same idea. Now, for the Christian, we believe that there is a God who created the universe. So a rational being created the universe. It makes sense that then the universe bears the marks of that rationality and purpose. And we believe humans are made in his image. Therefore, we have a mind that operates in some degree like God. It actually works to find truth. Now, can we prove those? Well, that's a different story. Well, that's sure. philosophy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> But I think my point being, so far, I don't see that the other path of denying revelation or trying to develop a philosophy based on human autonomy itself is working. Yeah. I mean, in Christian thought, our minds are designed with the building blocks to be able to seek and understand answers to these kinds of questions. Right. And that's huge. I mean, that's foundational. That's mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, we, we actually can start having these conversations because we hold that 
God has designed us to be able to have these kinds of right. thoughts and conversations. So, And apart from the idea of proof, okay, put aside whether we can prove that or not, it's internally consistent. Yes. Yeah. Whereas if I believe my mind is water or it's simply a manifestation of fire, then I don't think it is consistent with that to believe that then that mind is able to find this kind of truth. Yeah, it seems like the the question of proof can get in the way a little bit. If, maybe if, if you're if you're seeking that if if that's what you need, I don't know. Maybe not. But <laughs> well, we talked about this a little bit before in one of the other episodes. Well, you can't prove either way. Is what I'm trying to say. That's kind of where I'm at now. Is I don't believe any worldview can prove its most basic premises or presuppositions, but some of them have presuppositions which are internally consistent with the belief statements they make, and some don't. Mm. And I think that's how you have to evaluate or adjudicate between those two. Yeah. Yeah, it is really amazing Heraclitus' conception of unified diversity. To me, this is a guy who's got an extremely sharp mind. And to be able to think in these kinds of terms and to look and see, okay, yeah, there is unity, yeah, there is diversity, and those things are working together— Christian doctrine is going to pick up on that a thousand years later in the, the formulation of the Trinity. Sure. And we, we say that, yeah, the unif- unified diversity in the world comes from the mind of God who exists eternally as a unified diversity of three persons. Mm-hmm. So even that, I'm, I'm seeing the way that that is uh, picked up in Christian theology. And we, we get to it there not from rationality alone, but from Scripture's revelation. Yeah. But you can certainly see the way that those two things are working together because a lot of the men who formulated that had a lot of Greek philosophy embedded in them because of their situation and where they were in the world. So you you see those things working together, not apart, getting to it from different perspectives. But Heraclitus, he's approaching some pretty impressive things. Yeah, I think so too. I think so too. It seems to me that the idea of the Trinity encapsulates and agrees with one of his main ideas that there is a a unity that goes beyond and depends upon diversity. Mm -hmm. And maybe the Trinity is the ultimate expression of that in some ways. Yeah. I'd like to unpack that in a future episode. That'd be fun. Yeah. The the philosophy of the Trinity. Might be a while if we're going to keep going on the history of philosophy. (laughs) We still... Yeah. (laughs) Maybe when we get to early Christian philosophy, maybe we'll do that. That will be good. All right. Well, anything else about Heraclitus? No, that's uh, more than I thought we were going to talk about. So That's great. And thank you for bringing him up because those of us who aren't well-versed in Greek philosophy, he's not a common household name like Socrates or Plato would be. So, And he's not a disease. And he's not a disease, which is good. Yeah. And he had Legos (laughs) and the Logos. Absolutely had Legos. All right. Thanks, Daniel. My pleasure. See you next time. Thanks so much for listening. If you like what you hear, click follow or subscribe depending on your platform. Check the notification bell so you're up to date with new episodes and leave us a review. Until next time.